Habakkuk. Uh, the stone, the stone, dead, dead stone's office. Amen. Habakkuk, on Wednesday night, we've been looking at some minor prophets. We've looked already at Haggai. Haggai. Remember Haggai? You know what I remember about Haggai? And if you'll just put a thought with a book, remember Haggai was the not yet crowd. Remember me preaching on that? The not yet crowd. It's time to do this. Not yet. Not yet. Well, it is time to go out on a blitz. Don't say not yet. So we don't want to be a part of that not yet crowd. We want to be a part of I'm ready to go crowd. All right. Then we looked at Micah. You remember Micah? You remember Hosea? We've looked at those three. We've looked at those three. Tonight we're going to look at Habakkuk. And uh, I haven't uh, uh, got uh, a direction on where we're going to go next Wednesday night, but we're going to go to some minor prophet next Wednesday night. All right. In the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk had difficulty understanding and justifying God's ways. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not up to a man to try to justify God's ways. But I'm talking about in Habakkuk's mind. In his own mind, he had a problem understanding and justifying God's actions. Why God did what he was doing. And um, you say, I've never done that. But when you, we get through with the message, you might say, well, maybe I have. Maybe I have. You see, um, Habakkuk was greatly perplexed and worried over the confused issues that were going on, just as men today are confused and bewildered. In other words, why, why does God allow all of the sin and devastation to go unchecked? See, that's what Habakkuk, he, 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 couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't figure it out. It, it overwhelmed him. That God was doing nothing about it. With the sin as rampant as it is today, and with that, 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 that stupid decision the Supreme Court and Justice, Justice handed down just about a month or so ago, uh, why, why isn't God doing something? Well, you know what? God is doing something. God is letting man have their own way. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, in two places there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The worst form of judgment God could ever let America go through is to let America have its own way. Because the end result is a collision course. So we're going to find that out in Habakkuk. And Habakkuk's going to teach us how to handle some things. Fact is, um, look at, uh, while you're in Habakkuk chapter 1, look at verse number 2 just for a moment, 2 and 3. The Bible said, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Well, you and I both know that God hears everything we say. Hears every time we cry. Knows everything going on. But Habakkuk just could not understand why God wasn't doing anything. Habakkuk was praying that God would step in and fix the situation going on in Judah. But it just seems like he didn't do it. He said, How long shall I cry and thou shalt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity? And cause me to behold grievance. For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. There are people living lawless lives. And you're letting it go on, God. That's what Habakkuk was saying. That's what he was saying. Now, uh, let me give you something else too. Hold your place in Habakkuk. Go back to the psalm. Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Not only did Habakkuk do that, the Bible says that one of the psalmists did it as well. In Psalm 73, and um, I believe this is where I want to go. Yeah, 73.12. It's a psalm of Asaph. The Bible said in verse number 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world... They increase in riches. Why is it the psalmist is saying that I love you and I'm serving you and I'm living for you and these that are acting so ungodly, these reckless individuals living outside the church is, is making all these bad decisions and they're prospering. And I'm starving to death in here. 
See, the psalmist had the same complaint, basically, that Habakkuk had. Well, the Bible says in verse 13, the psalmist said, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. Have I been doing all this in vanity? Have I been going to church every day in vanity? Have I prayed every day? Have I given my tithes and offerings every day? Have I tried to help people every day in vain? It seems like every time I try to help somebody, the worse off I get. Now, you've never thought that or said that, I'm sure. But the psalmist did, and Habakkuk did. Now, if you'll notice, the Bible said in uh, verse 14 of the Psalm 73, For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until it was painful to the psalmist, until what happened? Until he went in the sanctuary. It was a, he said, he said, all right, God, that done it. He said, I understand now. Didn't have any more problem after that with that issue anyway. With this issue, he might have had another problem, but not with this issue. After the psalmist went in the sanctuary and God, and God actually showed him the hearts of the wicked, and it looked on the outside like they were prospering, but they were meeting up with utter destruction. And you know utter destruction for a man that does not trust Christ is what? Is a lake of fire. And so the, 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 the Lord showed the psalmist the heart of the individual, the wicked. It was roaring. It was roaring. It was just unstable. It was unsettled. So at least those of you that have trusted Christ, you have peace that passes understanding. Uh, we were talking in Bible study today. A fellow told me this morning he had joy. He said he had joy unspeakable and full of glory. He said nobody could take his joy away. See, when you're a saved man, you got joy, you got peace. You got peace of everlasting life. You don't have to wake up. You don't have to worry about going to bed at night and dying and where you're going to wake up in eternity. You don't have to ever worry about waking up in the flames of hell. If you're a saved man, you're going to, you're going to know that you're going to wake up in the very presence of God based on the Scripture, based on the Word of God. Well, so the psalmist found that out. Well, if we go back to Habakkuk, Habakkuk found the same thing out. But let's go on just a little bit now. Why does the world have to suffer while ungodly men plunge us deeper into ruin? That was Habakkuk's whole main argument right there with God. Uh, when is God going to change the tide and cause justice to reign on the earth? Um, the silence of God was just really too difficult for Habakkuk to take. Now, we can find the answers right here in this book. Now, let me show you something else, too. Let me show you something else. And, and uh, I can't get away from it. And it, it, it may throw us off Habakkuk just a little bit. But let me go over to Romans chapter 8 while I'm thinking about it. This morning, a question was asked, or yesterday, a question was asked in Bible study about um, the world is so wicked, and it is wicked. And there was a, there was a young lady up in Tennessee that... Uh, said that she could not believe in God because God, God would not let her baby happen to her baby what happened to her baby. It was born deformed, it lived a little while, and then the baby died. And the ba that's a sad, sad situation. And as a mother, she could not believe in God because that happened. And we're seeing bad things happen in the world, but yet we got preachers standing behind pulpits saying that don't worry, God's on the throne. And God is on the throne, by the way. He that keepeth Israel never slumbers or sleeps, is what the psalmist said. God is wide awake and God is on the job. But let me tell you why that things happen like... Let me tell you why that people find little babies in dumpsters. Let me tell you why that it's on the news that so-and-so in Mobile, Alabama was murdered. Let me, let me tell you why this woman was ravished and raped and left for dead. Let, let me tell you why that... It's because it's the heart of man. God had nothing to do with it. God had nothing to do with it. But because Adam plunged us into sin, this world is on a collision course with destruction. And Romans 8 will explain it. I've had I don't know how many people in my 30 plus years of ministry come up and say, Brother Owen, I can't understand if there's a God, why does this happen? Well, let me, I said, let me show you. Do you have time? Do you really want to know the answer? Do you really want to know the answer or are you just trying to argue and fuss? If you really want to know the answer... Turn over to Romans chapter 8. And the Bible says in Romans chapter number 8, the Bible said in verse 18, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, 
but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. I'm going to say something about that here just in a moment. Verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. That's what we're waiting on as children of God, the redemption of our body or the adoption to wit. The outside's going to match the inside one day. But let me back up. The Bible said there in verse 21 of Romans 8, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto this glorious liberty of the children of God. Verse 20, let me back up to verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Back in Genesis chapter number 3, it records Adam falling into sin. Eve, uh, Eve was uh, deceived, but Adam was not. Adam deliberately, deliberately, knowing good from evil, Adam deliberately partook of the fruit that God told him not to partake of. And he did it, of course, to, to be with his bride. And that's a good picture of the Lord Jesus Christ becomes sin for us, who knew no sin, that he could redeem his bride. Who's his bride? I am. You are if you're saved. We're his bride. So he redeemed us. But now, when Adam plunged the whole world into sin, Romans 5, 8 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon who? All men, for that all have sinned. So we were born to die. We, we were born deteriorating, wasn't we? Now, God set this thing on a collision course with destruction. Why? So that we could have a Better hope. And what's the better hope? The redemption of the body. Now, if you're not saved, you don't have that hope. You, you, don't, ha you don't have that hope. And it's, it's just like um, someone was asking me not too long ago about um, the, reason, the reason they were sick and people are sick. And they tried to use that verse out of Isaiah chapter 53, by his stripes were healed. That means we should never be sick physically. If that, if that verse means what a lot of charismatic people think it means then nobody should ever be sick. We shouldn't even have a prayer list up here praying for sick people. If that's what that verse meant. But it doesn't mean that. People are going to get sick. They are going to get sick and people's going to die because Adam plunged his whole world into sin and God ordained it. We're subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. I am, on the, I am on a collision course of deterioration, but you know what I have? I got a blessed hope. I'm going to have a brand new body that will never suffer. Amen? Never, ever, ever suffer. So we learned that too in Habakkuk, believe it or not. We learned that in Habakkuk, uh, that we see this world going that way, but we have a blessed hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, let me get back to that charismatic crowd that says you shouldn't be sick. Who would want, just being logical, just to shut their mouths... Who would want to live in, in this body for eternity? And don't, you, don't talk about mine either. Look at yourself. <laughs> Who would want to live in this body for eternity? You see, and the aging and the aches and the pains. I don't want to. I'm going to have a brand new body. Job said, though the skin worms destroy my flesh, yet in my, this body, yet in my flesh, I'm going to stand for the latter day and he's going to look at Jesus face to face. I'm going to see God in my youth in a glorified body. All right. So that's, that's, uh, that was free tonight. We'll go back in Habakkuk. Go back in Habakkuk, if you will. All right, let's look at the times. Let's look at the times that Habakkuk preached. The prophet had witnessed the revival, the wonderful, great revival of Josiah. We have been talking about Josiah for the last two months here at the Faith Baptist Church. We have been talking about him. If you want to know anything about Josiah, you can go to the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 22, or you can go to 2 Chronicles, chapter number 34. In 2 Chronicles, chapter number 34, uh, he began to seek after God, 
and he did that which was right in the, ho- in, uh, in the eyes of God. He repaired the house of the Lord his God in verse number 8 of Second Chronicles 34. He found and read the word of God. And when the word of God was read, Shaphan read it before the king. Shaphan read it before Josiah. When Josiah heard the word, he became afraid and he said, What's going to happen if that word's true? What's going to happen to our nation? What does the Bible say? They're on a collision course with destruction. So what did Josiah do? Josiah had the priests and the the preachers and the pastors read the word of God to everybody. Why? Because Josiah knew there would never be a revival without the word of God. Never be a revival. There had to be the word of God. And so they read the word of God and of course people listened to the word of God, began to heed the word of God and apply the word of God. And then the Bible said in verse number 31 of 2 Chronicles chapter number 34, uh, and his testimony and his statutes with all of his heart, with all of his soul, to perform the words of the covenant which are written in the book. In other words, if God said it, I'm going to believe it. If God said it, I'm going to do it. You know, I used to have preacher, uh, people tell me, and I would tell preachers, they say, preacher, if you've got enough guts to dish it out, we can take it. That's not true anymore. Uh, yeah, I got a few amens out of that. Yeah, you know, I, I think I can get away with murder up here till I, till I begin to really preach hard and I can't get away with it. But is that going to stop us from doing it? No, you know better than that. No, it won't. We're just going to preach it anyway, aren't we? We're going to preach it anyway and we're just going to wear it if it fits. I've been, at churches I've pastored, I've had people stop me and say, was you talking to me? I said, if it fits. So if you, from now on, as your pastor, if you stop me, individually and say, are you preaching to me? I'm going to look at you and say, if it fits. If it fits, wear it. Wear it. You know what I have to do before I preach to you? I've got to preach to me. That's right. I've got to preach to me. In studying the message, I do a whole lot of repenting there at my office desk. I sure do. So we preach the Word of God and the Word brings revival. So Habakkuk was the preacher that experienced one of the greatest revivals ever recorded in the Word of God. Under Josiah. He was under, of course, the good king Josiah, but he was there after Josiah as well. Josiah reigned 31 years. Isn't it something, if you got a good man and as a president, we're going to have some good years in the country. If you got a bad man as president, we're going to have some bad years in the country. There was a Manasseh before a Josiah. Manasseh was a wicked, nasty, ugly king, but thank God at the end of his life he got saved. I leave that out sometimes because I talk about how wicked he was. But in the end of Manasseh's life, Manasseh got saved. But because of the sins of Manasseh, God brought judgment on Judah. So that's how bad Manasseh was. But after a Manasseh, there was a Josiah. And there was a Josiah for 31 years. After this present administration, we could get a Josiah. Amen? And we know for sure that he could at least stay in there eight years unless the Lord comes back. Yet he could. We could have good prosperity. Things could change. You say we've gone too far to change. Don't tell God that. Amen. Because we've seen a lot worse conditions in the Bible that changed than what's going on in America, haven't we? Hallelujah. So it can happen. We can really have revival. We can really have revival at the Faith Baptist Church in Milton, Florida and and, and a real revival sent from God if we'll read the Word of God, apply the Word of God, pray, seek God's face, turn from our wicked ways, then we'll see the hand of God working in our lives. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. All right, so Habakkuk, of course, uh, preaching uh, during Josiah and then even after Josiah. Uh, Habakkuk had watched Assyria crumble. You remember Assyria is the one that actually took over the northern kingdom, Israel. And uh, he saw Egypt and Babylon fighting to take the place of Assyria. Yet in 605 B.C., there was a fellow named Nebuchadnezzar out of Babylon, which is present-day Iraq. Nebuchadnezzar defeated the Egyptians, and he took over the civilized world as his kingdom. So there was a lot of things going on after Josiah. Strife and lawlessness were the order of the day. The Bible says in Habakkuk chapter number 1, verse number 1, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Look up that word burden. That word burden means heaviness. Heaviness. Heaviness as a result of a message grievous to declare. God, this is what you want me to preach to the nation. That's a burden. The burden that Habakkuk had to preach 
to the nation. Very grievous to declare of what God was going to do to the nation of Judah because of their unbelief and their turning their backs on God. Well, again, strife and lawlessness was the order of the day. Righteous people were oppressed, according to chapter number 1, verse 2, and also verse number 13. We read verse 2, but look at verse number 13. The Bible says in verse 13 of chapter 2, or of chapter 1, excuse me, um, Thou art pure of pure eyes, and to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? In other words, God, why are you being quiet in all this going on? All this is going on. People were living in open sin. Nothing was hit. Did you remember the day, if you're my age or older, you remember the day that people used to hide their sin? I mean, you know, sin was sin. Wasn't right. Wasn't right then. It's not right now. But they did something about 50, 60, 70 years ago they're not doing today. At least they'd hide it. Now they're shacking up and boys marrying boys and girls marrying girls and, and just nasty stuff and don't care. Got out on my front porch the other day and some god-awful language come from across the street over there. I'm so glad my kids wasn't out there, my grandkids wasn't out there. To hear. I'm talking about some nasty, vulgar stuff. You know, there, there was a time in those days that, that uh, mom and daddy would come out there and mashed the mouth or took a bar of soap and crammed it so far in there they couldn't breathe. Yeah, yeah you remember moms and dads like that, don't you? Amen. Dad, I don't know if they still make them anymore. But they used to. They used to make them like that. Well, anyway, people living in open sin. Look at chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. The Bible said in chapter 2 of Habakkuk, verse 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his face, faith. Yea, also because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. So, People living in open sin, they were worshiping idols in chapter number 2, verse number 18 and 19, and so forth. So the times were pretty disgusting. The times uh, in after Josiah was just like the times that we're living in today. Just, just exactly like them. Now we see the man Habakkuk. The man Habakkuk was a very strong man of faith, but the facts of life were just too much for Habakkuk. He could not get his questions answered which overwhelmed the preacher Habakkuk. He could not, Habakkuk could not reconcile a bad world with a good God. Habakkuk was an honest searcher after truth who was willing to go to God directly for an answer. Just like the psalmist did in Psalm 73. Habakkuk said, I need to know why you're not doing anything. And all of this stuff going on. You know what the Bible tells us to do when we get like that? The Bible tells us in the book of John, chapter number 5, verse number 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they, the scriptures, are they that testify of me. A lot of people really don't study the scripture. They're just going by what mom and dad says or what the preacher says instead of getting in the Bible for yourself. If you'll get in the Bible, God's going to give you some answers for why he's doing what he's doing. Guarantee you will. Guarantee it. Habakkuk got his answers. The psalmist got his answers. And when you begin to seek and to search, I guarantee you this, God will give you the answers you need. He'll give you the answers that you'll be satisfied with. Now, you say, has God always answered every one of your questions? Well, no, not always, but I'm satisfied. You know what God does for me if I really can't understand a situation? I'm satisfied that he's going to handle it somehow or another. Amen, I'm still satisfied. So he teaches me that in the Bible, to cast all my cares on him, for he careth for you, he cares for us. So that's what we're going to do, amen? We're just going to cast our care on him. All right, now, we, so we find that Habakkuk went directly to God. Now we look in, um, uh, again, the book, the, the book of Habakkuk, the, the gospel of Habakkuk, we see his protest. We've already read it uh, there in verse number 2, 3, and 4 of chapter 1. 
Uh, in fact, I don't believe I read, I read two and three. Let me read verse four of chapter one. Therefore, the law is slacked and judgment doth never go forth for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Nothing's being done is what Habakkuk said. Nothing's being done about the wickedness and so on. So there's his protest. In other words, why does God allow the wickedness and lawless man of Judah to continue unpunished? Well, God's first answer to Habakkuk, notice verse 5. Behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadths of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. God's going to let a heathen, Nebuchadnezzar, come over here and defeat Judah and ravish Judah because of the sins of Judah. That's exactly what God's going to do. God said that he's not inattentive. God said, I'm not inactive. I'm not indifferent. He tells the prophet Habakkuk to look beyond the borders of Israel that he's already working a work. What's he doing? He's already raising up Nebuchadnezzar to come in here and do what's needed. You see what he's doing? There's a far view in that. You know where you'll find that far view? You'll find that far view in the book of uh, Acts, chapter number 13, verse 37 through 31, when Paul actually, when, he, when, when Habakkuk is quoted, and, and he said he's going to do a work that's going to make you marvel. You know what the work God did to make the whole world marvel? You know what it was, don't you? The cross of Calvary. Cross of Calvary. It's going to cause the whole world to marvel. See, God is going to raise up Nebuchadnezzar to bring punishment and justice in to Judah for what they were doing. Habakkuk, you don't need to worry about it. I'm on a job. I'm wide awake, God said. I'm going to do it. So Habakkuk was seeking answers. God gave him some answers. But in the far view, there's coming a time that God was going to even make it better and did make it better. When did God make it better? On the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago, when God became a man and went to Calvary, and every sin that you could imagine that I've just named, that Habakkuk named, that Judah had committed, that Israel had committed, that Babylon had committed, that Egypt had committed, or Assyria had committed, or the United States of America has committed, God took all of those sins and He put them on Christ and then beat Christ, judged Christ for your sin and then tells you you can go to heaven because your sin has been judged in Christ. Is that good news or what? That's something to shout about. That's something to get excited about is Jesus died for my sins. And I can go to heaven because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so he gave him an answer. He gave God's first answer there. And read all of verse, verse number 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, he was already working a work. And he was going to use the Chaldeans to chasten Judah. Now there was a moral problem in verse number 12 through 17. Habakkuk complained of God's indifference. Now, now Habakkuk is horrified to hear the means that God is using to bring about judgment. All right, here's Habakkuk's other question. Seems like man just can't get satisfied. He was wondering why God wasn't judging Judah. Now... He's wondering how could a pure and holy and righteous God use such a wicked people as Babylon to judge a people more righteous than they are? Well, Habakkuk, you just asked me what I was going to do. And then Habakkuk says, well, why are you going to use somebody as wicked as Nebuchadnezzar to do all of this work? He challenges God in verse 13, if you'll look at it, verse 13 of chapter 1, he challenges God to defend his actions. In verse number 13, thou art, he, Habakkuk talking to God, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. You're, you're going to use a wicked nation to judge a man more righteous than Nebuchadnezzar, than the wicked nation. Well, an all-important decision comes up in verse 1 of chapter 2. All in, here, Habakkuk's finally reaching the end 
He's finally getting some answers from God and those answers from God are taking root in his soul and he begins to understand that God's a lot smarter than he is. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and will sit me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am what? When I'm reproved. <laughs> when I'm reproved. It's coming. It, it's coming. Look, look at verse 3, the latter part. Because it will surely come, it will not tear. It's coming. I guarantee you it's coming. Well, the important decision, the prophet finds a solution only, only, when he obediently takes his place on the watchtower to wait for the word of God. My dear friend, when we become obedient and open our Bible and say, Lord, please give me an answer out of your book. Tell me what you have for me. T tell me what I need to do. Tell me what I can expect. When I get to that place and the word of God begins... You remember Job? Job wanted to give God a piece of his mind. Y'all remember that story? The whole book of Job? God, God, you know, the, his, his three friends, and of course, Bildad and Elihu and Eliphaz, and then we had Zophar come along too, but, and you've, you've heard the old saying, if with friends like these, who needs enemies? Remember, they kept trying to get Job to invent a sin for why Job was going through his trouble. And Job, Job had too much integrity to invent a sin just to satisfy these pharisaical preachers. I've got too much. I didn't do anything, Job said. And he said, if God was here, I'd tell him that too. And so we read about how Job is going to really talk to God. And then finally, after 30-some chapters, God shows up. And Job doesn't say a word. <laughs> he, said, he said in Job 42, he, he, he abhorred himself and sit in sackcloth and ashes. When he, when he saw God, when he heard God, and he talked to God, he said, I found out just how wicked I am. You know what happened to Habakkuk? When he come in contact with the Holy God, he knew reproof was coming. <laughs> he, he knew it was coming. And my friend, when you and I get in contact with the Holy God, the answers come, the peace floods your soul, and I can end tonight I can end tonight the book of Habakkuk by telling you that everything in Christ is going to be all right. It really is. It really is. Look at, look at, the, look at the last uh, few verses of the book. Chapter 3, verse 16, 17, 18, 19. In 16, Habakkuk's fear had been conquered by faith. In verse number 17... Though all fails, verse 17 and 18, though all fails, trust in the living God. Verse number 19, the Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. In verse number 19, we live and walk far above doubts and despair. His questions, all of Habakkuk's questions have been answered. You see that? Wow, what a good message. <laughs> Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. It sure helped me. All right. Anybody have any comments or questions before we're dismissed?